Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Today you will hear again from Dr. Mukesh Jaiswal, who is one of the application scientist, works in the areas of next generation sequencing technologies. He will talk to you about whole exome sequencing kit for investigating rare diseases. This is probably going to be the last lecture on the NGS technology and its application. And while today's lecture is not going to cover much of the basics of NGS, but is definitely going to give you more information about possible applications from these platforms. So, let us continue on this lecture today and then we will try to conclude what we have learnt out of this NGS based platform from basics to the applications. Okay. So, today uh, uh, we are going to talk about the investigating the rare disease and its treatment with the Agilent solutions. So, it is, uh, so I am going to cover about uh, what are the rare disease and how uh, uh, basically it can be diagnosed by the NG solution and uh, how we can basically uh, give the treatment to the patient. Right? So, we have some solutions where basically, basically you use uh, Agilent solution for the diagnostic of rare disease and, and its, its treatment part. So, it is going to cover uh, some uh, background of rare disease and then uh, I am going to talk about some, some part of CRISPR-Cas, how, how basically it can utilize for, for the treatment purpose. So, what are the rare disease? Uh, rare disease basically uh, is, 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 is a rare disease, it is affected 60 million people in US and Europe. So, it is a big number, it is quite a big number. And 7000 uh, rare disease basically known in uh, till now and 80% uh, reason of that is, is genetics, is something wrong in, uh, wrong in their genetics. So, yes please. We are talking about 60 million affected in the US and Europe. Yeah. Is there any study for me? Any yeah, I am coming to the next slide. So, I am coming to the next slide. So, this is like some worldwide I am telling. So, now I am going to the next slide we have, I have Indian data also. And 50% uh, uh, affected uh, children are basically affected with this disease. So, so coming to Indian scenario, uh, yeah. So, ICMR, the Indian Medical Council of Research launched this registry 2017. And they said that uh, around 70 million people in India is also suffering for this rare disease. So, it is a quite big number and that is why they launch a project uh, ICMR registry where you can basically write a grant to them to work on the rare disease, what is the problem, how, how you can diagnose that thing, what is the treatment part of that. So, in 2007, April 2017, they, they launched this project and uh, so these are the key objectives of uh, this ICMR registry. So, its main, main objective is that to understand what is the problem of rare disease, what is the causation of that and, and how it can be, how this data can be utilized for the treatment of the rare disease. So, these are two uh, main objective of the ICMR and uh, uh, so, uh, it launched and I think it is available for the grant application also. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some of the rare disease which is existing worldwide. is is worldwide. So let's come in the first uh, cystic fibrosis. This one. So this is the this is a disease basically uh, where the excessive mucus is deposit on uh, uh, lung or pancreas, which cause the respiratory failure and inability in the digestion part. And the median survival rate for this disease is 40 years. Right, and uh, the worldwide is a uh, seven, 70,000 patients are known worldwide. Then leukodystrophy, this one, 
and this is again the progressive disease affect the brain spinal cord and the nervous system and uh, this this is basically children's basically affected or with this disease and the 5 to 10 year basically children's and around 60000 uh, children's are affected worldwide retinopigmentosa this is another disease and uh, it is it is affected uh, it causes the blindness and uh, it it basically the survival is is like 40 year and around uh, 100000 or 15 million 1.5 million worldwide patient are known for this disease so so what's the cause of this what's the cause of this the cause of this basically uh, sometime it is affected by the single gene or sometime it's affected by the multiple gene right so if it is uh, like the first one cystic fibrosis is only the one gene that is CFTR. There are several mutations on CFTR. And then this uh, transporter, transmembrane transporter is basically disturbed and that caused the cystic fibrosis. So in this cystic fibrosis, only one gene got affected, right? But if you see this, these two, the multiple genes are affected. So it's very difficult to uh, identify when the multiple genes are affected. So here, like 30 genes are affected here and in uh, uh, in this disease is 77, right? So problem is that uh, this caused the damaged neuron and here in the uh, uh, retinitis pigmentosa, it is cone cell and the root cells are basically disturbed, right? So these are the disease and uh, the, there are multiple uh, genes are basically involved in there. Some more, which is uh, included in the ICMR project basically. So this is, uh, this is childhood ovarian cancer. Uh, ovarian, ovarian cell carcinoma, endometriosis, and there are multiple genes basically involved in this, uh, this, this disease also. So this is also uh, incorporated in a ICMR registry. You can go in their website, you can basically look uh, what are the rare diseases. The challenge is that, is, is their diagnostic. How to diagnose this disease, right? So if you go the regular process of a diagnosis of this one this one is pretty expensive and doctor basically takes a, at least eight years to diagnose and they go like 40 different methods to diagnose this test so because the, the complexity of disease is not like one gene it's like multiple genes they are affected right and and the, the basically they they take at least seven years and 40 minutes to use for the <coughs> diagnosis so that's a challenge it, it is pretty expensive, it takes time. But for the treatment purpose, if you have early intervention of this disease, you know the cause of early, very early, then the very early diagnosis, then you can, you can do early intervention and then improve the quality of the life. So that is, this is a challenge. But if, if it take a lot of, like eight years to diagnose only, it would be difficult, right? So, in, so that's why, the, uh, that's why uh, it is very important to diagnose the disease in very early stages. So right now, if, it is, if you see this uh, rare disease, now uh, 2012 when the exome panel just started, it was only 130 gene. Now uh, 2017 is more than uh, 200 key mutations are known for other rare disease. Basically, uh, this is because of the more advancement of the exon panels. So, uh, is, is you need to extract the DNA from the patient, right? And then go for library preparation. Library preparation and then uh, target enrichment. After seeing the library is basically perfectly fine you can sequence and go for data analysis. So this kind of one workflow, uh, basically you can use our exome panel for the diagnosis of the rare disease. So the challenges is always there, uh, but I would talk about why, why the Agilent's exome panel is more uh, uh, better actually in sense, because we make uh, RNA baits, and it is, it is oligo baits basically, and uh, these are these are because we make the RNA bed, they they have the better RNA DNA 
hybridization and these are the high fidelity bases which we make by the inject technology. We make this, this bait by the oligo. So this is our high fidelity basis. If you see the error rate in the base, in, in the probes basically is very low in Agilent. It's like one or two uh, error basically in one KB. But others have lots of, uh, so, so we, have, we have the high fidelity probes basically which are bidirectional. It is used for the making the libraries. So this is the different ways uh, you can make the exome libraries. So starting material always with the genomic DNA, right? We have three different ways to make the libraries for the exome sequencing. One is XT, XT2, and QST. XT is basically uh, is this one. If you have a, a different patients, eight patients, right? You can make an individual library from each patient's independent capture, and you can pull while, while sequencing, right? When you go for sequencing, you can pull this sample and go for one sequencing run. So that's the XT preparation of the uh, exome preparation. Another, if you want to do the, some comparative study, you can barcode the patient sample and pull itself, A to 16. In one pool, you can follow by the capture and go for sequencing. So it, you can compare between the patients also, that is XT2. And another, another is live preparation is based on enzymatic sharing. So you can use transposis enzyme for the, to make the library space. So transposis enzyme, then habitation followed by the sequencing. This is the fastest way you can make the libraries for the exome sequencing. Okay, so performance for all these methods to make the exome library are, is pretty good and they get, they get very good coverage, more than 95% uh, coverage all the methods. This is the three pillars basically Agilent works on uh, basically uh, performance of the exome library, contents and the flexibility. We work from decades to improve the performance, content and the flexibility of the kits basically. So if you see, more of, most of the rare disease basically now studied by this panel, it's called a clinical research exome panel. And this exome panel contains the, all the exon region and also the, the panels on the intronic part of the region, which, which basically associated with the inherited disorder. We have the latest uh, uh, exome panel V7, this is mentioned V6, uh, but we have now V7, and that basically covers the, all the translational and the clinical research panel. It covers whole exam. Another, we have the very small panel of the focus exam, which is covered the disease association. But most of the most of the rare disease, basically, which I talked before, it is basically uh, used for the clinical research panel. So if you see the contents performance of this one. With, with this uh, clinical research exome panel, they, they have like uh, 5,000 gene is basically a deeply covered uh, with the disease associated region with the clinical exome. And the challenge is that when you, when, you, when you go for the diagnosis of rare disease, the most of the mutations are present in the GC region. <coughs> to make the library for the GC region is always a challenge. So, but in, with our uh, clinical exam panel, the performance in the GC region is very good. It's very uniform preparation of the library when you go for the GC preparation. So content basically, uh, what's the content on the, on, for, for, the, for, for, the, for the probes basically? It is basically uh, uh, designed by the Dr. Madhuri Hegde from Emory University. And they make the basically uh, the probes which is covered all the disease association, exon and intronic part, which covers maximum uh, rare disease parts. For example, this is the uh, leukodystrophy, right? And the, this pathogenic variant that is uh, G, uh, G, uh, G, uh, JC2, this gene, basically if you see, compare, because this is the GC rich region and if you just compare with the other vendor, you don't see any coverage. There's no, no coverage for this gene. 
and if you see the clinical exam panel, we covered this part also to be able to detect the five prime UTR variants with this disease. So, in this disease, this is the kind of pathogenic variant, and you can easily detect by the clinical exam panel. Another retinitis pigmentosa. If you see two other vendors, this uh, CFD1 gene is not covered in this part because this is intronic part. These are exonic part. Intronic part are not covered, right? But if you see our one is, is fairly covered, that part. That means is detection of that mutation is, is very easy on that. Then if you see this region, again, is well covered by this, uh, this, no, this is, these are all non-coding reason. These are well covered with the, with our clinical assess exome. And most of the pathogenic variant basically in, for rare disease is present on non-coding reason. So it is, is, is fairly covered with the clinical assess exome panel. So if you see overall in, uh, in the clinical assess panel, we cover all the clean variants, pathogenic reasons, and uh, it covers mostly like 98% regions are covered. And others basically has low coverage. So if you think about when, you, when, when the doctor is going to diagnose this leukodystrophy, it takes eight years, right, by the normal method. And the average test basically they do around 20, 30 tests to, to, do, to diagnose for this one. It takes eight years, right? And the cost is, is goes up like, it's like $20,000, uh, right? But when you do one simple test, uh, our clinical exam panel, you easily identify this mutation, and that is basically for the leukodystrophy. And it is very cost effective, right? And so it is it's just going to cost like, uh, like 15,000 rupees, right? So one test costs like 15,000 rupees for exam panel. Yeah, because it covers the intronic part, exome part, definitely it's going to detect that thing. But, but detection rate is faster, right? And it takes less time. So doctors start their intervention much earlier. With that, like suppose uh, this is our canton, we, but we doesn't make this canton in vacuum. We, we, we do the research and we make, we make the probes for cover all those reasons, right? But sometime uh, when you did some your experiment, right, and, and some part basically you think that this is the part, maybe pathogenic part, and it is missing, right? And, and you want to incorporate that part in your panel, so it is very flexible. We can customize the panel according to your requirement also. Suppose any, any gene and it is not uh, basic, the intronic part is not covered, and if you want uh, interested, I want to cover this part also. We can basically add this panel and incorporate in your panel. So that's our flexibility. So we work on three parts: performance, and the contents always optimized year by year, and then flexibility if you want to add more. Right. So it's very simple workflow that I I told. It start from the library preparation, then. We make the targeted panel by the probes, right? And then uh, data analysis and reporting. <coughs> Whole workflow basically takes three to four days and, uh, and it's easy to identify the kind of challenges for a diagnosis of rare disease, right? So now this part is kind of over, like uh, if, you, if, you, if you get uh, some kind of mutations, right? In, in any disease, not only in rare disease, of course, cancer, right? And uh, but it's, it, it is multiple mutation. And you want to solve this problem for the treatment purpose. So we have a tool called as the CRISPR-Cas, where basically you can do, do the gene editing, right? And to, 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 to uh, solve, to fix that gene for the, for the, for the treatment purpose. But, yeah, but this is very early. We launched some libraries for the treatment, but it's very early stage. Let's start with that. What is a CRISPR-Cas? This allow you basically to allow the mutation to correct maybe, or gene editing. So it is based on the guide RNA, 
right? So this is the guide RNA, this one, and this is the site of recognition, and this is the Cas9 enzyme. When this become active, they attach, and it goes to the PAM site, like this. If it is identical or hybridized on that, like this, it is identical with that, it creates a nick, right? This Cas9 enzyme, when this guide RNA is specific to that, it creates a nick. Now it allows you three possibilities. One possibility is that just leave like this and body repair, body system, our, our cell system basically go for non homologous joining and cause the knockout of that gene, right? It creates a knockout. Second is the homologous recombination. If, if you want to do the gene editing and you some have homologous sequence, you can incorporate this homologous sequence in that, right? Third part, this is the deactivated Cas9 enzyme. This yellow color part, it might be activator or deactivator. Depending upon the activator, it can induce the gene expression or reduce the gene expression. So it allows the whatever mutations basically you got from the exome panel, right? You can basically try to correct or you can do the gene editing for the treatment purpose. So that's whole story, exome panel and what's, what's their follow up. So we are working on the functional genomics where basically we can uh, try to edit these genes in a large scale like, and uh, it, it might be any knockdown knockout and knock in anything and try to edit their genes to solve the problems so this is the if you study the functional genomics so very first prospect is knockout right if it is knockout means guide any breaks that one it makes the truncated protein right so if your protein not going to work is truncated protein knock in means uh, is basically it going to add some tag on that, on the protein. Turn off means if it is a higher expression, this is the, in, this is the repressor fusion. If it is uh, turn off means the lower expression of the gene. This is the genomic mutasis, mutagenesis. Here basically it's a side specific mutation you can create by the CRISPR-Cas. Suppose you got some mutation and you want to solve that mutation, right? You can change a base by base by the mutagenesis, right? So this way you can correct that SNPs you got, right? You can correct that part. So this allows you to cite specific changes with the Cas9. And if you want to do <laughs> some, some genes are basically low, lowly expressed in sub disease, you can basically induce the expression to the higher level. Right, so it can induce the gene expression. So you can do multiple function by the Cas9. You can induce the gene. You can you can repress the uh, gene expression, or you can do the side specific changes in the gene. Right, that's allow you five different possibilities to do. So uh, now the question is that suppose you like in cystic fibrosis, right? You work on single gene, and there may be one or two mutations. You got with the exome panel, right? And you want to fix that problem, right? So there's two ways. One way means if one gene and few mutations, so basically you're going to use four to five different guide RNAs, not more than that, right? So for that one, you can make the guide RNAs in your lab. So suppose uh, this is this is the target basically. You're going, to, uh, you're going to make a guide RNA for that one only. So this is the target panel, target, target you want. Just add the T7 promoter on that, right? If you add the T7 promoter on that and go for, uh, so the kits basically what they have, they have a T7 primers and go for in vitro transcription to make a, a guide RNA. For in vitro transcription, you make a guide RNA, which is the reverse complementary to the target, which is going to be reverse complementary to the target. So this is the kind of guide RNA 
this is this is the red part basically is very specific to the target you are way, to the part where you are interested for and this is the backbones minimum backbone and this when this going to bind on the target gene this this targeted part in the presence of cas9 enzyme this gene basically cleaved into part if you verify this one if in the presence of cas9 this gene basically cleave off right so this allow three two three five different possibility again basically going to maximum time is going to knock out the gene right <coughs> so if it is your genes in 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 numbers as one one or two gene and you want to use the you can make a guide in your lab also right but mostly it's not a case is not a case there are multiple multiple genes are going to, is involved for the for any complex genetic genetic right like retinal pigmentosa 77 genes involved and mutations is like more than 1000 mutations are basically involved there right so what we do we make a guide rna for that for that panel right and this is totally custom custom thing is we don't make we some make some catalog but we some totally depend on the users so we make a guide rna on a slide we uh, cleave that one from the slide do the pcr amplification and packed on the viral particle now is ready to transfect in the cell system that much guide rna basically we see for that mutation right it going to ready for transfection and you can use for the therapeutic opportunity for this right. so this is the this is The target cells are actually cell culture. Yeah, cell culture. So it's 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 a viral particle. These just these just cells basically to transfer directly into there. Cells are then transfer with this guide RNA. They already have a Cas9 enzyme, so it create the means Cas9 is there, right? So it going to cleave that part of the gene, or it depend on what what you design basically. So those cells would be cleaved. Yeah. so see I, i told you this is in very this is very early stage again to do this thing you need to do lots of screening lots of ngs work to identify it going to work or not so this is just just a thought and guide rna is, is, is we can synthesize for you but again the protocols and how you going to translate to the actually patient is very is in very early stage it is like 10 20 gene you can make in your lab but it is more than 1000 gene in high scale then we can make i uh, means uh, is is for the high scale not not otherwise you can just make in a lab just just uh, your your any target at the same hmm you yes, specific target just add the t7 promoter on that use t7 primer and do in vitro transcription that's inside the guide rna So it's very straightforward protocol, but yeah, again you cannot make the thousand guide RNA for multiple gene, right? In that approach, you can use this these guide RNA st uh, strategy and try to solve the problems. But yeah, I I would tell you this is this is not easy. It's very very hard, right? It's it's very hard because if you see this this going to be uh, like thousands of the guide RNA and going to transfer in the cells, right? now you going to go give some uh, uh, treatment by drugs right and then you need to go for screening protocols day by day and again you going to verify this this thing going to be work by the validate or not by the ngs but of course this is the thought and you can basically try to solve that problems so in that con contest <coughs> excellent is happy to collaborate with the people who are interested for to make a guide rnas right and we already had some some guide rnas of different disease like if you have the cancer panels we already have the these are the genes and these are the guide rna we make already have some and there are multiple multiple panel like mitochondria gene expression protein membrane these are the panels we already made we already catalog pack panel you can use that one 
but uh, again the how it going to work and how it going to screen it is a little diffi difficult task <coughs> so in summary means uh, you can use the ngs application to identify the causation what the cause of that and and i give the little brief idea how the crispr cas can be best solution for the drug validation and personal genomics so this is this is something uh, you can use the ngs application to identify the problems and crispr can might be used for for the treatment part right so now i'm covering a five five to five slide from the ivf uh, segment so in reproductive medicine the most challenging part in the ivf is that uh, aneuploidy in the embryos whenever couples go for the ivf and they do the in vitro fertilization and 70% are the embryos are basically aneuploidy right and uh, so what doctor do at least in india what doctor do they they look the good looking embryos identify it and basically uh, implant like 3 to 4 embryo sometime 2 sometime 3 depends so the challenge is that when doctor do this thing if the good looking image and probably not going to implant so your ivf cycle is fail if it is two embryos are good so both going to implant it going to give twins if it is three good embryo it going to give three kids right so it's a challenge you get either one two or three there's no there's no control on that right so we are discussing with the ivf clinic and working on the single embryo transfer paradigm means check the embryos they are good enough they are euploidy embryo not aneuploidy and only one single euploidy embryo is basically uh, go for the further ivf cycle and for the implantation so we are discussing this thing with single embryo transplant doctors basically do they do the blastocyst culture and they don't do uh, they do the biopsy and frozen of the embryo but they skip this part pgs pre implantation genetic in india and after vertific uh, frozen these embryo taken and go for the ivf so they use 3 to 4 embryos and directly implant what we are talking to doctor do the pgs identify the good embryos once good embryo and implant process for the implantation so you, the doc the couples get, get going to get only one kid right so when when we talk about the problems if they they with the pregnancy goes with the two uh, two twins there is a lots of problem with the preterm labor preeclampsia and its high rate of the prenatal death in the twins right so that's why we talk talk to doctor go for this test <coughs> means you can go for frozen with that do the pgs pgs means you just go for the screening of all 24 chromosome identify all the chromosome are good enough identify the euploidy embryo and then go for the ivf so how basically they do by transferring the one embryo basically it also is cost effective for the couples also it's, it's five times less pain basically to grow the kids right so how they do this test is basically done by the biopsy of the embryo so this is the embryo and this is the this is the blastocyst and they take the one cell of the embryo only one cell of the embryo so this is one cell they collected so when this biopsy is done one cell is collected from the ivf uh, embryologist and for that because one cell has a very low amount of dna you cannot do anything with that so we we do we do the whole genome amplification to increase the quantity of dna right and we label with this dna with the with the sci3 and sci5 type right and hybridize on a microarray slide and go for the analysis right 
if there is some mutations, this is the mutations, if some mutation on the chromosome number 3 or chromosome 20, 22 or deletion at chromosome number 21, it shows that this embryos are aneuploidy and do not process for the for the IVF, right? So you can identify this by adding the PGS test. You can basically identify the aneuploidy uh, in eight hours, and and after do this, basically the success rate of the IVF basically increase. When they don't do any test, the success rate going to be 80 percent with this single embryo transfer paradigm. Right, because he identified the all the chromosome where's the where's the problem? If it's a deletion, don't process for the IVF. So this is the smart ART, right? It j j before to doing uh, process for the aneuploidy, just do the PGS, validate this embryo or good enough, and then go for the IVF side. Right. Thank you. All right, so I'm sure after listening to today's application based lecture, you must have found this very interesting. And you saw that how the whole exome sequencing kit can be used for diagnosis of rare diseases and how the results can be used to choose the right treatment. I'm sure this is just one of the success stories of many things which can be done on various type of NGS based platforms. Dr. Jaiswal also briefly gave you an idea about CRISPR-Cas technology, which is one of the much talked about gene editing technologies available. And I hope you have enjoyed not only today's lecture, but also the series of lectures which we had in the last couple of days and week about NGS technology platforms. And this is one of the revolutionary technology which is really transforming the way we have seen the medicine and clinics are really you know getting revolutionized with much faster pace of assays coming to the clinics for the patient care. So your understanding and your knowledge about these applications and these novel technology platforms are definitely going to be very useful and I must say there is a wealth of data available now from various type of genome sequencing projects. If you know what you are looking for you can do a lot of uh, data analysis from yourself. I will give you one instance one example. The Cancer Genome Atlas (TCGA) is one of the good resources for looking at the you know patients' cancer data available. And while they published that work couple of years ago in Science uh, and Nature, series of papers published. But what is more important when they made data publicly available for thousands of patients' genome data, then the meta data analysis from that data, many people have looked at very specific type of questions. What is the impact of given genes in patient survival, for example? or looking at a specific pathways and you know maybe hundreds of papers are actually published just by looking at data alone not by generating data right. So what, what I want to convey you is that you need not to generate the patient derived genome sequence data just for the sake of looking at everything biologically. You if you are interested you can just go download these data use many of the publicly available software and resources analyze in your own manner. And then probably you can get some very meaningful and new information even possible just by looking at these data for addressing certain questions. So I hope some of these exposures what we are trying to provide you is going to really make you more comfortable and also make you more enthusiastic and motivated to really take lead forward. Well, I will thank you to stop today's lecture, but we will have more exciting things to continue uh, in the next lectures as well when we talk about a new resource for you which is human protein atlas. Thank you.